everybody. Welcome to Real Estate Investing for Busy Professionals. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome to Real Estate Investing for Busy Professionals. My name is Daniel Homland. Today, we have with us Dave Zook, who's going to talk to us about ATM fund investing. And it's interesting because this group has recently said they're interested in talking about more than just real estate transactions, although I bet there's some real estate transactions involved in placement of the ATMs. Um, but uh, this is going to be more about passive income and how ATM funds can bring passive income. So Dave, I'll let you introduce yourself and welcome to the group. Well, thanks guys. Thanks for having me, Daniel. And thanks uh, to everybody who showed up. This is going to be fun. Um, as a form of an introduction, I um, come from a family of entrepreneurs and, and business owners, and I was born into um, the sort of modular building business. My dad owned a modular building business, and I've been involved in the modular building business ever since. And um, so I, I, as I'll share in my presentation as well, I, I ended up building a couple businesses and get myself in a real tax problem. Uh, paying a half a million dollars a year. Some of you know what that's like. And uh, so started paying a half a million dollars a year, got really tired of that really fast and decided uh, to do something about it and uh, started really getting into some of these alternative assets like ATMs uh, that were giving me lots of depreciation to offset the tax liability on that income. So if you're stuck in that trap, and my, my gut feeling is if you're part of this group, you're probably not. But if you're stuck in that trap thinking uh, conventional wisdom or embracing conventional wisdom, thinking, well, if I make a lot of money, I got to pay a lot of tax. It's just not true. And I'm going to prove that to you. I'm going to talk. We're, we're going to spend some time talking about ATMs and some and I may even discuss a, a few other uh, things that I do to offset my own uh tax liability um but it's really you know it, it's really when you start out to build wealth if you can control your tax liability and live the tax efficient life um that's going to be it's going to be like the difference of swimming upstream uh, against the current or turn around and swimming with the current if you can start living a, the tax efficient life so i really spent a lot of time, energy, effort doing that for myself, got myself in the position where I'm tax efficient, making uh, deep into the eight, eight figures, most of that passive. And um, so, you know, I'm just here to tell you, this can be done and uh, we're gonna talk about that. So Daniel, I don't know if you've got my uh, presentation that I emailed to you or if it was too large, but uh, I may be able to figure this out as well. Uh, I'm used to operating on Zoom. Do you see the uh, red hang up button? And then look yeah. two to the left of it, there's a square with an arrow inside it. That's your share button. There we go. Uh, all right. And I'll, I'll grab the presentation here and make sure this is coming through. I'm still in the process of emailing all the people who registered with the club link. Is there anybody here that meetup.intel.com did send them the link? Or did you all have to externally find it from a different location? I'll, I'll, I'll take that as you all had to find it. So I'm going to continue emailing it out. So we can see your screen now, Dave. You can. I can't even see my own screen. What is that about? All right. <laughs> How about now? Can you see it? Good. We Yes. There you are. Perfect. All right. Perfect. So, um, okay. So are we ready to go? All right. So, um, as I was saying, I, I built several businesses. Most of them had to do with the modular building space. Um, I got myself into the tax problem. I soon figured out by hanging around smarter people than me, I figured out that there was a way that I could use real estate, specifically multifamily apartments at the time, to offset the tax liability on my income. And so I built this company, um, The Real Asset Investor, and, it, and really at first it was about building uh, a, a passive income column for myself. Um, and it, it, I, I entered this space because I was trying to solve a very specific problem. I was trying to solve my own tax problem. I went from paying a half million dollars a year 
to paying zero the following year after you know really deploying cash, really starting to do business a little different. We're going to talk about some of those before we dive into ATMs and what ATMs are about. So I'm pretty sure uh, for the people in this group, uh, if you're taking time out on your uh, Friday lunch, uh, that you would agree with me on this one. If you're if you're uh, a person who's investing in themselves, my my gut feeling is you're probably not the conventional kind. So uh, I trademark this quote: "You can be conventional or you can be wealthy, and, 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 but you got to pick one." And I really believe that. And that is, you know, it it it, it really has m much more to do with just you know uh, conventional wealth. You can take this pretty much wherever you want to go, whether it be health, whether it be wealth, whether it be um, you know fitness, whether it be you know just all all kinds of things. You know, most of the time, conventional wisdom isn't going to serve you too well. So I was building. Uh, I grew up in this business. I the 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 building on your left is the building that or the the place that my dad bought the year I was born, and we were building. Uh, storage buildings and portable, uh, you know, outside, uh, outdoor uh, detached garages. And, and then we moved to the building to your right on the screen. And my office is now all the way to the, to the, to the right front corner of the building upstairs. I got a nice office in that building, but it's really, um, I got started in this business and, and, uh, you know, as the years went by, I got out of my teens into my twenties, I started building uh, several businesses. Many of them had to do with the modular. A couple of them had to do with the modular building space. Um, built a couple of these companies. Got to do. You know, started doing really well in the modular building uh, space uh, on my own, and um, really started making a lot of money. And uh, got myself in a position where I had to start paying half a million dollars a tax. You know, a year in tax. And I, I just, you know, I, I was. I was believing the conventional wisdom that I was being fed that, you know, if you make a lot of money, you got to pay a lot of tax. And, and, you know, my CPA at the time was, was, um, you know, telling me that, well, you made, made a lot of money this year. That means you got to pay a lot of tax. And I was believing that. So I was, I was building these businesses and uh, let me see here. I was building these businesses and, I was building these businesses, but I, I, I really, you know, I was, I was making a lot of money, but I was this guy. I was the tax slave, you know, paying almost half the money I was making back to the government, and it was getting old really quick. And I remember, you know, after reading Rich Dad Poor Dad, and then you know, consuming most of the rest of whatever Robert Kiyosaki wrote, he made this quote that just tore me up: "You can make millions of dollars a year." And pay no tax legally. I had no idea what he was talking about. I, all I ever knew was if you make a lot of money, you got to pay a lot of tax. And so that drove me crazy because that wasn't me, and I didn't know how to do it. Uh, one of the other things that that you know, one of the other quotes that sort of changed my life was his CPA, Tom Wheelwright, said, "If you want to change your tax, you got to change your facts." Meaning. If you want to change your tax, you got to change the way you behave. You got to change the way you invest. You got to change the way you do business. And that quote changed the direction of my life. It was the first time in my life that I recognized that I was getting taxed because of the way that I was behaving, and that if I changed my facts, I could change my my tax. And so. I went down this path. I started, you know, I, I really, you know, some of the things that, um, you know, I, I learned what, what really what I did is I, to fast track my education, I figured, well, the quickest way I could uh, learn this stuff was to hunt these guys down. And I found out they were going on a cruise for, uh, you know, a seven day cruise. And, and, you know, I, I said, you know what, I, I got to do it. I, I I, I got to go on this cruise. I got to get around these guys. I got to hang out with these guys. I got to figure out how to do it. I soon figured out what they were doing. And I started buying an apartment buildings and using bonus depreciation and using cost segregation studies and started getting to the point where I was using the, the, the depreciation from these apartment buildings to offset the tax liability on my income and quickly went from paying zero in tax 
I mean, uh, from paying five hundred thousand dollars a year in tax to paying zero in tax, and it was uh, it changed my life. It changed my life, and and I share that because I want you to know that it doesn't matter what situation you're in. It doesn't matter how you make your money. There are um, there are options. There are ways that you can control your own tax liability. So before we get into ATM investment, I just wanted to, you know, I'm curious, and, and I want this to be, you know, there will be, I'm guessing there'll be a Q&A at the end. Is that right, Daniel? Um, yes, I want, yeah. Good. In fact, people put 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 your questions in the chat and we will read them off and we can have a Q&A Q &A time as well. Yeah, and 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 at the same time, if if you want, and if there's Q, if there's some Q and A going on, I can't see the chat. But if there's Q and A going on, and you want to stop me right where I'm at, and you want to interact and ask me to clarify or whatever, debate me, argue with me, whatever you want to do, you, you're you're certainly welcome to. So feel free to jump in and interrupt whenever you want. All right. So, so we're you know what's going on with real estate these days many of us uh, many investors are you know they're 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 seeing the changing markets you know obviously interest rates uh, have escalated in the last you know 12 to 18 months um there's a lot of uh different things going on in the marketplace there's buyers and sellers expectations many times aren't the same the buyers were you know, the, or the sellers were in the driver's seat for a number of years now, and they sort of got spoiled. They sort of got used to this. And and so now that there's, uh, you know, some different stuff going on in the market, um, the, the the buyer is starting to get himself in a position where, now wait a minute, you may think your asset is worth whatever, but, you know, here's what's really, here's what it's, you know, here's what it's really worth. Because at the end of the day, the deal has got to work for the buyer. And so, you know, it, it, the buyer eventually will win. The buyer eventually will win. The buyer's and seller's expectations were not, when they're not, not the same, um, eventually the buyer's going to win. Um, you, you've got, I, I do business in several different asset classes. And, and by the way, I just want to clarify something. You know, we're going to see several different asset classes that I'm involved in. We're going to focus uh heavily on atms because uh that's you know that 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 was the sort of topic of choice and i'm happy to um you know when when we get there um you know i'm happy to answer any questions i'll kind of walk you through what's going on and how it works um but the the asset classes the different asset classes that i'm involved in i'm seeing a trend and many of the you know we're, we're seeing that buyer and seller reset um there's there's opportunity coming let's just say there's opportunity coming you know hey, maybe hey, better hey, i was going to ask what what asset classes are you involved in which ones are you seeing that reset in right now yeah so uh, in the last two years i've purchased right around thirty thousand acres of land and with with uh, you know and it's very strategic and there's there's a real plan behind what i'm doing um we're we're doing a lot of self storage uh, we've got many institutional grade self storage facilities. We, um, you know, we've, we've been in that space since 2017 and we're also building a lot of, uh, Tommy's express car washes. We're, we're on pace to, uh, by the end of this year, be in the second largest franchisee in, in all of the Tommy's express, uh, car wash franchise. So we're building. We're we're on pace to build between eighty and a hundred car washes between now and and uh, you know four or five years from now. And so those are some of the other asset classes I'm involved in. But we're seeing this this common theme, and that is, um, you know, I'm I'm hearing it a lot. You know, let, let's say you purchased a multifamily apartment building three or four years ago. Let's say four years ago, and you you know a big multifamily apartment building, and you paid you know, somewhere between three and three and a half, maybe 4%, uh, you, you lock that in and, and that cost of capital is between three and 4%. Saw a lot of that. Um, let's happen. You let, let, let's, let's say you're getting to the end of that and you got your five-year rate lock. It's going to be expiring next year. 
Um, that deal may have worked at three or four percent, but it may not work at six or seven. And so there's going to be some forced selling coming up here. So just just know that you know there's opportunity coming, and um, you know the seller will not always be in the driver's seat. So just a you know just, just a quick aside. Uh, I want to talk about real estate because I know you know there's a lot of of uh, in the investment world, there's a lot of uh, real estate investors and specifically multifamily. Uh, but I think as, as a shrewd investor, it's our job to find the value. You know, which asset class is that? There, there's, there's a bull market. There's always a bull market somewhere. Like, you know, when there's a correction, you know, there's always you, you know, not everything goes into a bull market. We do a lot of, you know, you ask about some of the other asset classes. I'm a big fan of natural gas. Been a natural gas investor for almost five years. We put a fund together for the last two years uh, with a family outside of Pittsburgh that, that, you know, it's been in the business for you know almost 50 years. And, and you know, one of the best gas producers, one of the lowest cost gas producers in the country. Um, but it's our job to find value, find value in the market, in the marketplace, which asset class do you create, create value? You know, if you're, if you're thinking you can go out and buy a stabilized a class multifamily apartment building in today's market, that's going to give you great cash flow. And, and, uh, you know, it, it, there's not, uh, let me just say, there's not a lot of low hanging fruit. And so you may have to go out and create value. We're, we're buying small pieces of land, one to two acres, and we're building car washes and building a business uh, on that one to two acres of land. That's creating value. We're buying self-storage facilities uh, from mom and pop operators, and we're um, adding 30,000 to 50,000 square feet of climate-controlled self-storage onto that. We're forcing value. Um, I, I mentioned our land acquisition. We're bringing talent from several different uh, several several different sources and creating what once was, from a seller's perspective, a single source of income or revenue. And we, we're creating multiple income sources. The Inflation Reduction Act. Act I did a whole webinar on that uh, two or three weeks ago that talked about the opportunities. And if you want some, reach out to Daniel. I'm happy to send it to you guys. Um, but it talks about a giant bill that's got hundreds of billions of dollars flowing into different spaces. And, you know, it's our job as investors to find, you know, whether we like the bill or not, whether they're, whether it's toxic or not, and most of them are, um, you know, there's, there's always opportunity. Renewable energy is one of them, but I, I'm just here saying, look, there, there is a bull market somewhere and not all asset classes, you know, go into a slide when you got things going on like interest rate hikes and that kind of thing. So I'm going to talk about a couple of these asset classes that I'm a fan of. We're going to hone in specifically on the ATMs and I'm going to give, I'm going to kind of go down that path and, so, and show you sort of what an ATM uh, can look like in your portfolio. First of all, I, you know, Daniel mentioned that, you know, you wanted to talk about something other than real estate. I will just tell you that ATMs in their simplest form, an ATM investment is a real estate investment. It may be one of the highest per square foot return on investment you can get from any real estate play. I mean, you're talking about a two foot by two foot piece of real estate that you're monetizing. Okay, so the ATM is just that that the, the big square box or that big box you're looking at there is setting on a piece of real estate. You're really that's no different than if you took a one acre piece of land and you put a multifamily apartment building on that piece of land. You're monetizing the real estate. Same thing you're doing here. It is a real estate play, and so you're you're, you're the way you make money from an ATM investment. Every time somebody comes in there and puts their card in there to get cash out, that's going to cost them somewhere between probably two to four dollars. Okay. And most people, many people think that ATMs are owned by banks or institutions. Not, not normally. 
they're they're normally owned by investors like us uh sometimes they are owned by big institutions like cardtronics and some of the big atm players big you know billion dollar revenue companies publicly traded companies but many times they're owned by small investors so what we've done is we've taken uh we started this business about 11 years ago it was a small friends and family fund uh i stepped in they asked me to come in and help them grow the business uh stepped in and and started you know working with them directly about as a partner um about um seven or eight years ago and today we're one of the top four atm operators in the country so how does it work so when an investor comes in and purchases an atm they they make an atm investment you're you're buying a unit of atms that's five to six uh atms one unit equals five to six atms uh that unit's going to cost you one hundred and four thousand dollars. okay $104,000 is going to get you somewhere in the range of $2,100 to $2,250, $2,260 per month. So your cash on cash return is going to be somewhere around 25%. You get paid first. Um, you know, so you get your portion first. What happens when you make the, and, and, and I'll just tell you generally how the ATM space works, whether, you know, there are many there is sort of like self-storage there there's a lot of ways to make money in self-storage i love the self-storage space there's a lot of ways to make money in the self-storage space there's a lot of ways to make money in the atm there are, well several ways to make money in the atm space you can be mom and pop you can be a mom and pop operator you can you can manage 100 to 150 atm machines in a 50 mile radius that can be a very lucrative business for you um you can do it. Uh, you can you can invest in a publicly traded company like uh, Cartronics. I can make the argument. I can make all kinds of argument on why you wouldn't would not want to do that, but you could. Um, we're somewhere in between. Um, we um, get into some M and A mergers and acquisitions. We buy out a lot of the mom and pop operators. Regulation is going to get or, or is getting stiffer on these smaller operators, so they're heavily incentivized to cash out many times. But really, what happens is when somebody swipes their card, the money comes in. The money is usually that surcharge revenue is usually split up in three different ways. Um, First way is um, to support the uh, the lease on that little piece of real estate. You know, you're talking premium real estate there. You're talking high foot traffic and some of the, you know, some of the you know very desirable um, locations. High foot traffic deli in a corner street in Manhattan or somewhere like that, where where you got a lot of foot traffic going past uh, going past your machine. So that's a portion of the surcharge revenue goes to service that the lease on that real estate another portion of that, of that surcharge revenue goes to the management team you know they're the they're the people that maintain they're the people that keep the cash in the machine they're the people that you know they 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 manage you know everything they're you know all the the working um parts of that of that business they're managing that and then the passive investor also gets a portion of that cash flow. So you got the cash flow being split up from that surcharge revenue in three different ways, the real estate, the operator, and the investor. And so I, I don't know, I, I, I can take a breather right there if you'd like, uh, Daniel. And I, yeah. you know, if you really, if you want, I can take this in a whole bunch of different directions. But I'll let you take over there for for a couple minutes, or as how long as you want. And well, if you want to talk about any of these other asset classes, I'm happy to. I just don't want to steer away from the main topic. So I'll let you drive the conversation, and we'll let it go wherever you want it to go. Sure. We we had a question in the chat actually about uh, is he talking just about the the ATM itself? I thought this was a talk about a fund, and so. Um, just uh, I, I guess so what I'm understanding from your business model is you're going around you're buying up these mom and pop operators and self storage and car washes. Um, do you place these ATMs, you know, exclusively at these locations or are you going out and leasing them, you know, all around to different businesses? And then how does that tie back to investor funding? So uh, the answer is we are buying. Okay, so so 
picture this. There is a whole infrastructure, and I'll get back to your question about the fun. Am I talking about the fun? Sorry, I, I threw two questions at you. My, my mistake. I read, I read your email that said that I cannot sell, promote, advocate, take, you know, you know, I'm here to educate. So I will talk whatever you want to talk about, about ATMs. If you want to go into, you know, how our fund works, I'm certainly happy to do that. And I'll, you know, and sometimes I can, you know, I'll, I'll restrain myself. I won't sell unless you force me to. So, so um, It's a gray but, line. We do want to hear about how the fund works. I'll try to stay in line. So if I get out of line, you, you, you stop me. So, yes. So when we purchase, uh, so, so look at it like this. So if, if you're a multifamily apartment investor, there is a whole infrastructure built around multifamily apartments that will service you from insurance agents to bankers, to brokers, to lenders, to, I mean, you, you name it. There's a whole infrastructure, property management, there's a whole infrastructure around multifamily apartments, right? So if you're a big player in that market, if you're, if you're the, you know, one of the top four players, one of the top 10, 20 players, you're going to know what's going on in that space. You're going to know the other players. You're going to be in the game. No different in the ATM space. There is a whole infrastructure built around ATMs. There are portfolios that are trading. A lot of them happens at the institutional, you know, in the, in the institutional realm, but there's a whole infrastructure around it. So, so really what's going on most of the time, what's going on, we're one of, we're doing one of two things. We're buying from another institution and we're, or, or we're, we're unseating somebody, let's say another big player. Let's say, let's say there's a hedge fund. Oftentimes a hedge fund has a clear entry and a clear exit point. So they make it to their to the end of their five to seven to ten years of that fund and say, okay, we're liquidating the fund. Or they may have this timed out where you know most of the ATMs in the fund are at the point where they need to be replaced and then they exit the fund. We're a buyer in some of those funds. So there's two things that are important to know about our business model. Uh, we're we're buying existing portfolios, and the reason that's important to know is number one is when we buy an existing portfolio, we know exactly what we're getting into. You, you know, no different than than when you buy a multifamily apartment building. You you ask for the buyer will ask for a T twelve. He'll want to see the history on that building. He'll want to see the cash flow, the net operating income. Same thing here. We can look at every ATM machine in that portfolio. We can see exactly how many transactions they've had over the last two to three to five years. And, and know what we're getting going into the game. Like we, we know what that location will produce for us or has produced for us in the past. Um, the other thing is we're not going out into the marketplace and saturating the marketplace with a whole bunch of brand new ATM locations and end up diluting or competing with ourselves, diluting the whole, uh, the whole space. We're, it, we're, 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 unseating another player and taking over that portfolio and many times we're tearing out the old machines putting in brand new uh emv compliant state-of-the-art uh uh new technology better security features all that we're putting in brand new atm machines and then we're taking over you know we're taking over and that's you know that's when we start creating the cash flow creating the revenue for our investors from an investor's point of view, how how is this different than like a, a real estate syndication or or some other syndicated group fund? Uh, it, it specifically, you know, it's appreciation. Well, it's interesting that you ask because I was in multifamily apartment syndication. I was I, I had built a portfolio of three to four thousand doors um, a few years ago. Well. 2012 to about 2019, all but 2019, I built up a, a large portfolio of multi multifamily apartment units. Um, when when this opportunity came to me, I looked at it as a personal investment, and they were like, "Well, take it to your investor group. Like, we want you to partner with it. You want we want you to take it to your investor group." And I was like, "What are you talking about? Like syndicating ATM? Like nobody does that. Like you can't you can't syndicate a." you know, ATMs, like, but then I got to thinking, I was like, well, wait a minute, 
this deal works for me. I love this space. I love it. I mean, I love it for several different reasons. It goes right along with what I teach because I, I had started educating people about being tax efficient and building their passive income columns and and really building up their passive passive income. And and so I was like, well, wait a minute, I, I guess this could work. This really, I mean, this works for me. I love it. So I started taking it out to my investors. I put the deal together. They loved it. It's been one of our core asset classes for more than 10 years now. And it just um, it, it it resonated with a lot of investors. They love the cash flow. They love the 100% bonus depreciation. Um, there's just a lot to like and tax-free income. It, it's consistent tax-free income is hard to argue with. Yeah. So if, um, my, my understanding is the cash flow is quite a bit higher on an ATM fund and, uh, and the depreciation goes all the way, you know, it's hundred percent depreciated over the lifetime of the fund. Is that, is that correct? So the answer is yes so cash flow is uh very high compared to a lot of others um the depreciation last year until the end of 2022 is 100 percent bonus depreciation in year one uh this year it's now 80 percent bonus depreciation in year one you still get 100 percent bonus depreciation you don't lose that last 20 percent but you just don't get it in your, you just don't get the whole 100% in year one. You get 80% in year one now. So, really, th there's two ways that you can use that depreciation. Uh, one is you can use all of that depreciation to offset the tax liability on some other income. That's one way you can do it. Or you can do nothing. Let's say you don't have other, let's say you don't have other income that you that you need to protect and, and you just say, well, look, I, I want to create cash, you know, tax-free income from this investment. You just take that depreciation you, and you do nothing. That sits there in your depreciation bucket. And then when you make income from your ATM investment, that depreciation that's sitting in your depreciation bucket will wipe out the tax liability on any income that's coming from your ATM investment. So you sit there and, and create tax-free income for like four years straight. So we have so, another question. We have another question about is the 20% all given in year two or uh, is it spread out over the lifetime of the investment? It's spread out over the next five years. So you get 80% first year and then, the ne then that next 20%, there's a calculation. I don't have it off the top of my head, but it's really it's spread out over, over the next four over the following four years. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so the, from a limited investor's point of view, when they're, when they're evaluating, say like a, re, a, a traditional multifamily, for instance, or they're evaluating an ATM fund, I, I'm trying to understand the dynamics of how, why somebody would go with one or the other. Um, I'll let you take it. Well, so uh, a couple of things. One, uh, most people understand multifamily apartments. Uh, they understand that somebody's living in that building and paying them rent. It's pretty basic, uh, pretty easy to understand. Um, most people have not even looked at an ATM as something that they could profit from. They always looked at, at an ATM as something that the bank owned. And one of the reasons people you know, that, that's sort of the, the general common belief is because many times the banks are coming to us and, and paying us to wrap that ATM with, with their information, with their logos, with their stuff. And, you know, it makes it look like they own that ATM, but they really don't, but they're, they're, they're getting that brand recognition and they're paying us to wrap the ATM machine with their wrap. And so many times people didn't understand that, this, that it's even an asset class that they could invest in. Um, so, but when they, when they get the picture, when they do the deep dive, when they get the picture, you know, it's really not that hard to understand either. I mean, somebody's coming up and they're, you know, if you've ever used an ATM machine, many of us probably haven't, I can't even use, I own hundreds of them personally, and I can't even use an ATM machine if I want to. Um, I, I don't have an ATM card. Uh, but there's many people and, and and just to be clear just to make sure everybody understands our peer group is not the customer that's using these atms 
many of us have quit using cash. We've, we've, you know, we've uh, kind of moved on to plastic, uh, but there's a whole group of people who have not. They're the lower income folks. They're the EBT card carriers. They're the immigrants. And and when you look at the one of the fastest growing demographics in our country, it's that group. So when you consider that, and you consider the fact that the use of cash, that cash in circulation, currency in circulation, has more than doubled in the last 12 years, this, this business model starts to make a lot of sense. So in answer to your question, a lot of people, you know, it's not as conventional as, as multifamily apartments, and some people don't understand it. Yep. I just out of curiosity, this is a little out of left field, but I understand that um, ice machines and ice boxes are kind of in the same category. Have you ever considered investing in those, or or do you have a reason why you don't? I have considered it, and I would if I was to find the right team. Uh, right. I, I like it. I mean, show me. You know, again, when you take an ice machine and you set it at a street corner somewhere uh, where there hasn't been an ice machine, you're taking the risk and hoping somebody's going to, you know, somebody's going to come and buy your ice and you're going to be able to monetize it. Uh, but show me, you know, show me a clear path to profitability. And, you know, in order to reduce risk, you would buy an existing ice machine, pay a little bit more for it because you're not starting from scratch or it's almost like sort of a, a you know startup model where you take a little extra risk and maybe for for the hope for a little bit more upside but but show me a clear path to profitability and and a great team that's operating these things i'm in yeah i, I, I love I, I i briefly looked into doing it and realized i'd probably make a lot more money if i was living in arizona rather than oregon <laughs> doing <Absolutely. it. laughs> so we've got yeah. a couple of questions Phoenix, arizona would be a great place for ice machines we, we've got a couple of questions here. Ashish is asking, uh, what can go wrong with an ATM investment? Um, okay, so I would say the, uh, all right, this whole business model is set up for volume. You get paid on the transaction, same as a car wash. You know, you, you get paid on a transaction. You get paid when somebody uses it. You get paid when somebody runs their car through the, the car wash. You get paid when somebody swipes their card. So if that transaction volume goes down or stops, that's a problem. So then you've got to ask yourself, okay, what could go wrong? What could make that transaction slow down or stop? Um People quit using cash. The government put some kind of regulation on it. Um, Pandemic. Say it again. Pandemic. Yeah. Well, uh, exactly. So you know, we have, uh, and I'll give you a real life example of that. In the spring of 2020, um, well, in February, March of 2020, we went absolutely crazy. I mean, it was a great time to be. Uh, an ATM investor. The transaction volume went through the roof. People were scared. They were running for cash. They were cashing up. Um, in April, in back half of March, April, May, June, not so much. Um, however, we've got a big margin of safety built in. Uh, we've got a 28% margin built in, like a buffer built in between the investor and their projected return, meaning that the transaction volume could decline 28% and it would not negatively affect an investor. So in the worst part of the pandemic, um, some of our portfolios were down between nine and 11%. Um, it got nowhere close to putting them in danger of not making their uh, projected returns. We still had another 17% to go. One of the, one of the reasons uh, for the um, uh, the negative impact was we've got pretty heavy airport exposure. And airports are normally considered a, a, a class A institutional grade location, great location. You can secure an airport uh, location for your ATMs, good. You want that. Uh, in the spring, summer of 2020, not so much. So that had a negative impact on our, um, you know, on our margin. Um, one of the things that saved us 
was um, you know that saved us from from doing a a bigger dive. And and if you if you talk to some mom and pop operators, you'll hear numbers like uh, an eighty plus percent decline. Well, that's because they were in small retail, non essential. They were in restaurants and bars. You know what happened to those in in uh, the spring summer in twenty twenty. Um, but we weren't in those places. We were in mostly essential places, uh, convenience stores, gas stations, uh, CVS's, Walgreens, mostly essential businesses. And you know that was very strategic. That was no accident. Uh, but we we were in very you know you've I'm sure you've heard the saying. Uh, what's the most What's the three most important things about real estate? And that's location, location, location. Yep. Even more so, even more so in an ATM. It's the you know, it's locate very location centric. It's very important to pick a good location. Okay, when you've only got two square feet, you got to pick it right. Oh yeah, for sure. All right, Mario is asking. Do you? Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Mario is asking. Wh what does an exit strategy look like? Um. So okay. So a. Here's how our fund works. You're going to push me into this corner to where I start selling, right? <laughs> um, so here's how our fund works. Um, we put a seven-year deal together. So we contract with an investor for seven years. And, and when you look at the life of an ATM machine that's in a high performing area being used heavily, and then you also look at the technology be, you know, and, and how it gets outdated, you've got about a seven year, seven to 10 year life cycle. So we put a, a contract together with an investor. It's a seven year deal. At the end of seven years, your cash flow stops. We sell the ATM machine at fair market value, which is almost nothing. Um, you get about $3,000 back for the scrap value. Uh, and so when you're getting, you know, on your $104,000 investment, you're getting, you know, uh, when you include the tax impact at 220 ish thousand uh, dollars, you're getting that return back over the life of the investment. Not, you know, it, it's very different than than a multifamily apartment investment where, you know, you're, you're getting the cash flow, you know, for let's say seven years. Now, let's say it's a seven year exit. You're getting the cash flow, and then it's seven years you sell for a profit, and that's where you make a lot of your money, most of your money. Very different here. You're getting your cash during that seven years, and at the end of seven years, um, your your value is gone. Your your asset is depleted. Now, this is where it gets very important. When I told you that you can make between twenty four and twenty five percent cash on cash re return annualized. That's good, but when you consider the fact, but okay, that's really good, but it's not really fair when you uh, compare it to a an apartment investment. And I keep talking about apartments. So I could talk about self storage or whatever, but it, you know, kind of apartment investment has been sort of the asset class of choice over the last decade or more. Um, but it, it, it's really to to give it a fair comparison to a an apartment investment or another real estate investment, you got to go with the IRR in this one, because the IRR calculates the fact that you lost the value of your equipment over that seven year period, and that IRR is is right around nineteen percent. So if you can live with a nineteen percent IRR, this might be for you. Yeah, that's really fascinating. So. Uh, the asset itself, the value goes to zero over the time period of the investment. So, you know, it's sold for scrap, like you said. And so the investor is not getting anything back at the at the end, but the cash flow is high in between. You know, it just gets my my wheels turning a little bit. I wonder, you know, could you do that with could, could you could you buy a fleet of cars and make cash flow off of them like an Uber or 3D printers or there, there's a lot of interesting things that you potentially could fund in a manner like this. Well, and, and anyway. some people get stuck on the fact that they don't have an asset at the end of, you know, they're okay owning brick and mortar that will increase in value over, you know, a period of time. And they're okay selling that asset, you know, having a, a, a defined entry point and, and with a seven year projected, you know, look at the end of seven years, we're going to sell this thing. That's good. They have a, they feel like they got a real asset and they do. Um, but 
they're, they, you know, they may have a problem with an ATM investment just simply because, well, look, at the end of seven years, my, you know, I don't have the asset. Well, my question then becomes, well, if you owned a self-storage or an apartment building for seven years and you sold it for a 19% annualized IRR, would you be happy? Oh my goodness. Yeah, that would be a great, that would be a great deal. I was like, well, there you got it. ATMs will give you a 19% IRR over a seven year period. So right. it, 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 it's a matter of perception. And, you know, of course, people, people have their preconceived notions about an investment that they're really, that's really more conventional uh, along the lines of real estate or, or apartment building. Right. I, I like it because it gives you a boost of income and gives you the depreciation to offset it. That's, that's so, always a great story. So uh, to your point, um, I, and that's why we like it to your point, if you invest in an ATM, uh, and this was when there was 100% bonus appreciation, now you get 80. But typically, when when you invested in ATMs, you got you know from the time you made the investment, and you had you know 12 months of cash flow, and you added your tax impact bonus depreciation on the front end, you got 60 to 70% of your principal back in that first 12 month period from the time your cash flow started till you got out to there to, to 12 months, you got 60 to 70% of your principal back in your pocket. Now you just reduced your risk by 60 to 70%. You still got six years of cash flow behind that. So when you look at it like that, it's like, oh my goodness, okay, now I can go redeploy that cash so quickly. Um, so that's where the magic happens. That's, that's when it comes really cool. Vasuki here is asking quite a few good questions. So I'm just gonna go through them. Uh, what right. What does downtime look like for an ATM and how do you handle it? Um, so that is an important question and it's important that you keep your downtime as you know limited as low as you possibly can. Hours are somewhere between 98 and 90, 99% run times or uptime. Um, that is extremely high for the industry. But you know, as you can imagine, when that machine isn't working, you're not making money. So great question. And kind of a follow-up to that, um, how do you handle income stream protection in case of damage or theft? Um, have so, you ever had somebody steal your ATM machine? I, I just have to ask that. So the answer is we carry a heavy insurance policy, which we seldom use. Uh, the answer to the second question is yes, uh, very seldom because these are bank grade bolts and they're bolted down from the inside. You can't just you know, you can't just go and unbolt them. They're bolted down from the inside, inside the bolt. Um, and so, but but it's happened. Uh, there was two of them. The most recent one was about, I don't know, six, seven years ago when the, the, there were some riots going on in Baltimore. Um, there was two ATM machines that got stolen. And we, of course, there's tracking mechanisms in the software, in the machines. And we track them down to a local weld shop where they're trying to uh burn a hole into the vault to get to the cash uh these are bank grade vaults they didn't get to the cash but you know the, the of course you know the atms destroyed at that point but we we carry a heavy insurance policy and and i would tell you that that is an isolated incident you know that was six or seven years ago it's not something that happens very often at all all right and then evasuki's last question here which is a great one how do you assess capacity in the market to absorb more atms how do you know when a particular area has reached saturation? So that is also very important because you know the, when you have too many ATMs in one place, you di you know every dilute there's dilution. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, the important thing is we aren't going into an area ninety between ninety nine and one hundred percent of the time we are not putting a new ATM machine in a new location. We're putting a new ATM machine in an existing ATM location. So we're not um, diluting, we're not saturating a market. We're putting an ATM, we're putting a new ATM machine where there was an old ATM machine. So, <clears throat> you know, while there may be some um, saturation going on from new locations popping up, seldom, but when it does happen, it's not coming from us because we're buying an existing location. Which, 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 in reality, it it reduces risk to all of our investors because now you have a predictable location. You know what that location has delivered over the last two, three, five years, 
and you know that that location is going to deliver results comparable. Okay. Uh, Nita is asking a quick question here about the lifetime of the investment. So the income and the depreciation are both over the lifetime of the investment. They're not where you have income for several years and then the depreciation is over a different time period. Is that yeah, so, so Yeah. So it's equipment. So if you do not take the bonus depreciation, you would just take the, the five-year depreciation. Uh, but it's a, but to to her point, it's a it's a seven year cash flow stream. So you got five years worth of depreciation. You got seven years worth of cash flow. You actually got more cash flow than you do depreciation, which it, which which is a good thing. But it's you know you you at some point you got to manage the last couple of years of that cash flow, and you got to take some other asset class that has depreciation to to to, to manage that. Uh, cash flow. So it, it becomes a game of managing your cash flow, managing your tax liability, and and just keeping yourself tax efficient using real assets with depreciation to, to continue to manage your cash flow stream. And the numbers get bigger. I mean, you know, you start adding, adding zeros, but the, right. but the concept remains the same. We've only got two minutes left. Dave, can you put your contact information up there so people can get in touch with you? And we've got two more questions left. Vasuki is also asking, she didn't quite understand how you're getting 70, 60 to 70% of your money back up front through depreciation. And I suppose this this might be because, you know, the majority of people here are W-2 employees. Are, are they getting that money back at that time that they can redeploy? So if you can use that depreciation, okay, so so a couple things. One, I, you know, I, I don't, you know, it doesn't matter if you're a W-2 employee, if you are a business owner, if you own assets that give you depreciation, you know, I think wherever you are in life, I would highly recommend you start building that passive income column because passive income is the easiest sort of income to protect. Uh, you should never pay tax on your passive income. Well, you should never pay tax on your ordinary income either. And there's ways to do that. But it's so simple to not pay tax on your passive income. You should always be building that. But if you have no other passive income, if you have no capital gains that, you know, something that you're selling, a building that you're selling, <clears throat> and all that you have is W-2 income, then that would not apply to you. Uh, at that point, if you had no other passive income, you basically just take that depreciation, set it in your depreciation bucket, you wipe out the tax liability on the cash flow that's coming from your ATM machines, and you would have four years of tax-free income coming from your ATMs. All right, so, in, so, in answer, so in answer to your question, it does not, this is a passive investment, it does not wipe out the tax liability on ordinary income. All right, Dave, if, if people here want to find out more about ATM funds, so they can go to info at therealestateassetinvestor.com. Is the there any real, other place? Therealassetinvestor.com. Oh, sorry. Yep. yep. Is there any other place that you would like to uh, That is going to be the best place. Um, here is here is the problem. I, as you can imagine, I get wrapped up into all kinds of different things. And if you email me, I might be a little slow because not because I don't want to get back to you, but because I I got a lot going on. But my team is very very responsive. And if you send an email and ask them anything that has anything to do with ATMs or tax or the income coming from any of that stuff, they will be all over it. Now, if you just totally insist. And you want to take the risk that'll take me a day or two to get back to you, you can stick Dave in the front of that thing and say Dave at the real asset investor.com. Either way, either way, we look forward to talking to you and we we uh we would love to do some business. But hey, everybody oh, oh, Daniel, Daniel but but I will have to sell another day because I'm not allowed to do it today. Hey everybody, could you take yourselves off mute and thank Dave for coming in and talking to us today? Thanks, Dave. Thank you, Dave. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Dave. It's been really informational. Thank you. It's been fun. <laughs> All right. And we'll see everybody back here at Friday at noon Pacific. Same bat time, same bat channel. <laughs> see you guys. See you later. Thank you, Bye -bye. Dave. Bye-bye.